I just want to encourage you, if you're watching this video and you didn't get a chance to get to church this past Sunday, I'd encourage you to go to a church of your choice and listen to God's word. It's important for people to get together, just fellowship with each other and enjoy each other's company and say hello. So, uh, and I know some of you have to work, some other circumstances and you're watching this video outside the church time. So, I just, but I want to encourage you to attend the church of choice and you're sure welcome to come to our church at our Father's house in uh, Elberly, Minnesota. We start service at 10.45 a.m. So you are welcome to come. And I just want to let you know that the message I give you is the same message Sunday morning, but I will add, subtract, uh, maybe go off on some tangents or more, just depending on how the Holy Spirit is moving that morning. So I want to let you know, and I usually give you a kind of a, a, a smaller version of the message, just for sake of time. But I've got a new series we're going to start. It's called Let Us Go Forward. And I'm referring this to, of course, with the pandemic that we've been having and being in their isolation and different things going on for the last four or five months. And the first part of the lesson is going to be number one is I, I know where I'm going. And we're going to be looking at the scriptures from John 13, 33 through 35. And then we're going to, the crux of the message is actually based on John 14, 1 and 2. But I want to just let you know that in the book of John, Toward the end, Jesus is talking to his disciples, kind of like as a parent or as a boss would talk to his children or the employees before the person or the parent or boss is going to go on a vacation or going to go extended time away. I want to set the stage for you. Jesus and the disciples are in the upper room, and the boys have been discussing with each other some trivial matters, and Jesus overheard them. And they were even actually arguing and wondering who was the best of all of them, and some different things that and Jesus noticed that they had not completely grabbed the concept of what Jesus was trying to get into the disciples. So Jesus took and took his robe off and wrapped around his waist, got a bowl and got a towel, and he got some water, and he went down and washed their feet. And so Jesus was telling him he was doing something he'd never, they'd never seen before. He was showing servanthood, servanthood in a real way. This was the Son of God that got down on his knees, and washed the disciples' feet because they were dusty and dirty from walking the past day when they went to uh, celebrate Passover. And then also Jesus uh, got a new covenant with them when he shared the bread and wine. That's what verse 34, and we'll look at those verses real quick. And he gave them a new covenant when he gave them the Passover bread and wine, but he changed it. And that's what we celebrate as communion today. And so I want you to be aware of that. John 13, 33. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So Jesus says he must go away and leave, and he can't come with me, is what he's telling the disciples. So Jesus wants to leave some instructions with them, kind of like a teacher before the last day of school, instructions, read during the summer, or a parent get ready to go on vacation. Your kids behave now. Listen to who's ever taking care of you. He wants to reassure them that everything they have witnessed for the last three years is the teachings that he's been giving to them to try to get into it. But he's going to be talking, and that's what I want to look at in John 14 and so on, is that he's going to give some final instructions before he leaves. And I think we need these instructions because we're in a time that's kind of perilous and it seems like the world is speeding up and we need to follow what Jesus told us, just like he told the disciples. He was, so he's going to go and leave some instructions. So now I'm giving you a new commandment, and it is to love each other. And it says, just as I have loved you, you also should love each other. This was a, not a suggestion or a recommendation or a directive. It was a commandment. Why was it new? Because Jesus says, as I have loved you. Jesus showed them the Father's love for all of mankind. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well, somebody they didn't normally associate with. How about the woman with the bleeding disorder that reached out and touched his garment and was healed? He paid a lot of attention to women because they weren't very highly uh, taken, or taken care of or respected in that society. How about the healing of the sick, the healing of the blind, the ones that had to sit along the edge and we're asking for alms. How about the healing of a raising of Lazarus, uh, a friend? How about uh, not stoning a woman that was caught with a man in adultery or um, 
in a position that she wasn't supposed to be in, but they didn't bring the man, they brought the woman. And how did Jesus, he accepted her, didn't accept the sin, but accepted her. How about eating at the tax collector's place? How about casting out demons of a man? How about uh, turning water into wine? And it's actually good wine. How about cast, uh, restoring walking like a walking to a man that was born from birth? And they were asking him, who sinned? Jesus wasn't concerned about that. He was concerned about healing for this man that had been born with a deformity since birth. It is the how that is the new and the new commandment. Remember their feet were washed by the humility and the love of Jesus. Jesus showed them how to truly love. Verse 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So there's a little Jewish, you know, Jesus saying, how do you do it? How do you show love? Well, it's not the little Jewish fishy things that you want to give out and hand out to everybody. It's not what would Jesus do uh, bracelets, what WWJD, or the t-shirts with catchy phrases on it. No, it is by the love shown by the followers that you, the disciples, will show love to this world. And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus didn't tell them to become fluent in knowing all of these scriptures, all of the Old Testament, or how to argue and proclaim each point. He didn't say start a bunch of denominations and then you guys focus each denomination on their certain teachings that you can argue about with each other. Jesus didn't say that the world will know by your moral character. Jesus didn't say how to make social posts and how to make blogs and argue and argue and argue. Jesus said the world would know him how? By his love, by your love as disciples, as followers of Jesus. So let us stand out by how we love, not by how we preach or debate or demonstrate or vote, but by the way we love. There's a term called cancel culture. And that basically, and I looked it up because I, I'd heard it, but I wasn't familiar what it actually meant, but it's a term that is described as publicly shaming people for bad tweets, opinions, or past transgressions. And when we say bad tweets, what is bad to one person is honoring to another person. So it's a culture that just is putting down people, putting down what you said, especially with social media. I submit to you that we, as followers of Jesus Christ should be in a cross-forgiveness culture. Uh, I know cross-culture can mean interaction between different uh, peoples, different people groups. We're all actually one race. We have just different colors of pigmentation and different peoples of where we grew up at. But I want to tell you that cross-forgiveness culture is shame and guilt are canceled by love and grace. The love and grace that God the Father showed us by sending his son and then his son with his disciples is showing the world love. So verse 14, 1. So Jesus looks at the guys and says they may be apprehensive and unsure what is going to happen. Kind of like today's world. What's going to be happening next? So take a seat with the disciples at the table. And I want you to listen as we just look at a couple first two verses. Verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. I don't know about you, but it's hard not to let the things seem to permeate inside of us that's going on around us. We are worried about ourselves, how we're going to get through all of this. Maybe our children, our grandchildren. School's been shaken up and upset by what's going on. Maybe your parents. You've got some older parents and you're worried for them. Worried about the house or maybe the farm or the acreage you live in. You'll be able to keep up payments. Maybe you're worried about work. Maybe you're worried about your savings account if you're somewhat retired and the world's going to crash and it's not going to be any money for you. So when you hear about more cases of coronavirus, or how about 82 days, maybe 84 by the time you get this message, days of unrest in whatever city you're talking about. I think a couple of cities out west that have had continuous days, it's 80 plus days. Or maybe China and U.S. not getting along, talking about trade wars and all the different things. Say to your heart, don't be troubled. That's what Jesus is telling us. Don't be troubled. So how do we not be troubled? 
situations may or may not change. It is not like Star Trek and where uh, Captain Kirk says, beam me up, Scotty. Not that easy. It's not going to happen that way. The situations aren't going to change, especially right away. It is the second part of verse 1. Trust in God and in His Son, Jesus. Trust is putting all your weight onto trusting in the Lord. And I have a little example I want to just tell you. What it means, the trust is really a powerful word that's being used here. And it means to have complete faith. And I've got here on the floor a step stool. And I've looked at this step stool and I already tried it once. And I believe it will hold my whole weight. So what, what this trust is essentially saying, I know that this step stool is going to hold my weight. So I'm going to step on it, put all my weight on there, and I'm okay. I've trusted it. I know it's going to do it. And that's what Jesus is telling us to do, is to trust in him. To trust to put all of our weight, so to speak, of our troubles, of our worries, and put them on his. And we're going to do it three ways. One, we are going to have troubles. That's, that's just going to happen. That's part of life. Number two, don't let the troubles trouble your heart. Well, little catch a phrase. Don't let troubles trouble your heart. And the number three one, and it might seem awfully simple, but it's true. How not to? Trust in Jesus. Say, trust in the Father that cares for you and loves you. Some of you are saying, that is nice, but it's good for you, but you don't know my situation. No, I don't know your situation. Uh, we've been through a lot of situations ourselves. I could share with you, you probably have heard one of the situations we had. We went through a tornado years, 10 years ago, as a matter of fact. Um, we've gone through different things in our lives. Um, my mother passed away at the beginning of, of, of this uh, pandemic we're in. And, you know, and that was tough. My dad died while I was up in the Boundary Waters with youth group, uh, doing kind of a mission trip with our youth and stuff like that. So there's going to be troubles that come along, maybe some financial things. As a veterinarian, I've seen troubles come along with dealing with animals and different things that you wish would turn out different, and they don't always do it that way. Question, if your heart is troubled, what do you really believe in? Do you believe in the fact that this step stool supported my weight? Do you believe that Jesus will take the weight of your burdens, of your troubles in your life, and allow him to be the one that you put your anchor in, so to speak, to put your weight on? I'm sure we've all argued this point. And I know I have. A healthy diet is good for you, right? We all agree with that. Do you really believe that? Did you eat that way this last meal you had? Or how about the last week? How many times did you go to a fast food restaurant? Or uh, my weakness is having ice cream. Stuff like that. Do you really believe that eating healthy is good for your body? If we do believe that, why don't we do it? The more, and there's a little quote, and it's from the American Heart Association. They've got all kinds of quotes on stress and all that stuff. But one of the bottom lines that caught me, the more your actions reflect your beliefs, the better you will feel. And that can be for anything. It can be our spiritual growth. It can be how we eat, how we exercise. The more your actions reflect your beliefs, the better you will feel. Allow Jesus to take over all the situations that you have. Do you believe that Jesus is in charge, no matter what the stock market does, what the government does, what the cities do, what cancer tries to eat away at your body? I know there is trouble, but you know what? I am not troubled. Jesus can be trusted, and I can put all my weight on him. There is more than enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? Jesus is preparing a place. He's making rooms for us in the Father's house. And the rooms are guaranteed, uh, designed specifically for our nature because we all have different sciences and different things. I know some of my church members believe he's got an astronomy room for me because I love looking at the stars and giving them instructions of what's happening in this coming week or the comet that was here not too long ago. Uh, my grandson brought his big telescope over and I, every other night or so I'll go look and see if you know what, there's four moons going around Jupiter, and one night two will be on one side, and two on the other side, one night four will be on one side, and none on the other side. And last night there was two on one side, one on the one side, one was missing. Well, I'd read it was actually going in front, across the front of Jupiter, and I could see the shadow of the moon across there. So it's just something kind of neat. So you need to believe in Jesus, 
and he is greater than any and all things and all troubles. Jesus went to prepare a place for us in number two. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you know, before Jesus left us, he gave us some instructions, instructions that we need to allow to sink into our being, into our heart, so that we aren't troubled. Yes, there's troubles around us, and but we aren't troubled, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us, each one of us, to put our faith, our weight, onto Jesus more and more each day. Amen.